In this lecture, we are going to discuss two important cell envelopes present in a bacterial cell, cell membrane and capsule. All cells possess a cell membrane which binds the cytoplasm and the cytoplasmic organelles and is present inside the cell wall. The structure of the cytoplasmic membrane is quite simple. It consists of a phospholipid bilayer in which the proteins are embedded. For simplicity, I have not include the, included the proteins right now in the diagram. We will talk about them a bit later. Let us first understand the basic structure of a phospholipid. A typical phospholipid has a polar head and a non-polar tail. The phospholipid bilayer is arranged in a manner such that the polar hydrophilic heads of the molecules form the outermost and the innermost surface of the membrane while the non-polar hydrophobic tails form the center of the membrane. Therefore, in an electron micrograph, the membrane appears as a triple layered structure with two dark electron dense layers representing the region of lipid heads surrounding a light layer which represents the hydrophobic central portion of the membrane by layer. The fluid mosaic model by Singer and Nicholson is the most widely accepted model for membrane structure. The fluid mosaic model describes the structure of the cell membrane as a mosaic of components including phospholipids, proteins and carbohydrates that gives the membrane a fluid character. In other words, the fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane describes the membrane as a fluid combination of phospholipids and proteins. Carbohydrates attached to lipids that is glycolipids and to proteins extend from the outward facing surface of the membrane. Let us now study the lipid and protein composition in more detail. The phospholipids are an integral part of the membrane. The phospholipids consist of two fatty acids attached to the hydroxyl groups at carbon 1 and 2 of the glycerol moiety. The fatty acids may be branched or may contain cyclopropane side chains. Fatty acids are joined in Easter linkage to two of the hydroxyl groups of glycerol usually with a saturated fatty acid at position 1 and an unsaturated fatty acid at position 2. To the third hydroxyl group is attached a phosphate group and to it is attached the polar head group. The polar head groups might be phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylglycerol or phosphatidylinositol. The lipid composition of the membrane also varies with temperature. For example, psychrophiles, the bacteria growing at low temperatures, have more of unsaturated fatty acids in their phospholipids. These phospholipids have low melting points and thus helps the membrane to remain fluid at low temperatures. On the contrary, in the case of thermophiles, that is, bacteria growing at high temperatures, one should not be surprised to find saturated and branched fatty acids with higher melting points. In general, sterols are not found in the bacterial membrane except in that of the mycoplasma. But some bacterial membranes do have pentacyclic sterol-like molecules called hopanoids. Hopanoids are synthesized from the same precursors as that of steroids and play a role in stabilizing the membrane. Let us now discuss the proteins which are embedded in the lipid bilayer of the membrane. It is true that the lipids are responsible for the semi-permeability of the membrane. 
but it is the proteins that are responsible for other biological functions. The proteins may be integral, peripheral or transmembrane proteins. Integral proteins are those that cannot be easily removed from the membrane unless detergents are added to disrupt the membrane. Their major portion is located in the aqueous solutions on one or both sides of the membrane. They are anchored to the membrane by attachment to a lipid. Transmembrane proteins are those which are functionally important transporters or signal receptors. These proteins cross the membrane many times and the bulk of their mass is within the membrane. Transport proteins have 10 to 14 transmembrane segments whereas signal receptors have just 7 such segments. The peripheral proteins are those that are loosely connected to the membrane and hence readily removed from the membrane without disrupting the bilayer. Let us now discuss the functions of the cell membrane. The first function is role as cell boundary. The cytoplasmic membrane acts like a boundary for the cell and cell components. It regulates the passage of nutrients and metabolic products inside and outside the cell. The second function is role as osmotic barrier. Since the cytoplasmic membrane restricts the passage of salts and polar organic compounds, it acts as an osmotic barrier. The next function is role in cell growth and division. The growth rate of any cell depends on the expansion of the membrane surface and all components must be inserted in a timely manner to allow cells to expand in size. Cell division requires a carefully controlled process whereby the membranes of the parental cells pinch together, fuse and separate to create two daughter cells. The proteins that regulate the process of initiation of DNA replication, separation of chromosomes into dividing cells and expansion of cell surface are all located in the cell membrane. The other functions of the cell membrane are anchoring the bases of flagella and formation of the endospores. However, the two most important functions are regulation of membrane transport and energy generation. We will discuss these two functions in more details in the coming slide. The bacterial membrane is semi-permeable in nature. The hydrophobic barrier of the bilayer restricts the passage of polar molecules. There are a number of transport systems which facilitate the transport of nutrients into the cell and metabolic products outside the cell. The nutrients may enter by passive transport and active transport. Passive transport takes place without the expenditure of energy and is of two types, simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Simple diffusion is the random movement of molecules through intermolecular spaces in the cell membrane and it takes place along an electrochemical or concentration gradient. It takes place spontaneously without the expenditure of energy or help of any transport protein. Facilitated diffusion requires the help of a carrier or a channel protein. The carrier protein aids in passage of molecules through the membrane probably by binding chemically with them and shuttling them through the membrane in this form or through watery channels in transport proteins that span the cell membrane. This transport also does not require energy and again is along the concentration gradient. However, major form of transport is active transport. Here, again, transport proteins are required. 
The difference as compared to that of facilitated diffusion is that the transport takes place against the concentration gradient. The other difference is that this requires expenditure of energy in the form of ATP. Transport is achieved through the ATP powered pumps that use the energy released by hydrolysis of ATP to transport ions and various small molecules across membranes against their concentration gradient. Most ATP generated during the cellular respiration of glucose is made by oxidative phosphorylation. An electron transport system is composed of a series of membrane associated protein complexes and associated mobile accessory electron carriers. The electron transport system is embedded in the cytoplasmic membrane of bacteria. Each ETS complex has a different redox potential and electrons move from electron carriers with more negative redox potential to those with more positive redox potential. As electrons are passed from NADH and FADH2 through an ETS, the electron loses energy. This energy is stored through the pumping of protons across the membrane generating a proton motive force. The energy of this proton motive force can be harnessed by allowing hydrogen ions to diffuse back through the membrane by chemiosmosis using ATP synthase. As hydrogen ions diffuse through down their chemical gradient, Components of ATP synthase spin making ATP from ADP and PI by oxidative phosphorylation. The cell membrane of prokaryotes may invaginate into the cytoplasm or form stacks or vesicles attached to the inner membrane surface. These structures are sometimes referred to as mesosomes. Such internal membrane systems may be analogous to the Christi of mitochondria or the thylakoids of chloroplasts which increase the surface area of membranes to which enzymes are bound for specific enzymatic functions. Mesosomes may also represent specialized membrane regions involved in DNA replication and segregation cell wall synthesis or increased enzymatic activity. However, mesosomes have now been proven to be artifacts created by the processes used to prepare specimens for electron microscopy. The outermost gelatinous sticky layer present outside the cell walls in some bacteria is called glycocalyx. If this layer appears as an extensive, thick, tightly bound accumulation of gelatinous material adhering to the cell wall, it is called a capsule. But if it appears as an unorganized, thin and more loosely attached layer, it is referred to as the slime layer. Some microbiologists refer to all capsules and slime layers in general as glycocalyx. These structures are not essential for the growth and survival of the bacterial cells, but their presence confers certain advantages to the bacterial cell. Capsulated bacteria produce smooth colonies as can be seen in the picture. As opposed to this, those bacteria that do not form capsules or slime layer form rough colonies as are shown in the picture over here. The composition of these exopolymers varies 
with the bacteria. In some, it is a polysaccharide, whereas in others, it is a polypeptide. The polysaccharide might be a homopolysaccharide, as in the case of leuconoxtoc, where the capsule is a homopolymer consisting of either only of fructose or glucose. In acetic acid bacteria, Acetobacter xylinum, the capsule consists of cellulose which contains glucose as the basic unit. On the other hand, the capsules of Klebsiella pneumoniae have heteropolysaccharides consisting of a variety of sugars such as glucose, rhamnose, galactose and sugar derivatives. In Bacillus anthracis, the capsule consists of a polymer of only D-glutamic acid while in some other bacilli it may be a polymer of both D and L-glutamic acid. We will now discuss the methods used to demonstrate capsules. In general, the capsules are non-ionic in nature and hence simple stains do not adhere to them thus making capsule staining a bit difficult process. As a result of this limitation, capsule staining works by staining the bacteria and the background more intensely than the capsule itself. Let us first discuss the positive staining method also called the Antony's method. In this method, you need to make a bacterial smear and allow it to air dry. Do not heat fix. What must be the reason for not heat fixing the smear? Think. I will come back to it a bit later. Now, flood the slide with 1% crystal violet and let it stand for 4 to 7 minutes. Rinse the slide thoroughly with 20% copper sulphate solution. Do not wash with water. Finally, blot dry with filter paper and examine under oil immersion objective. Because of the non-ionic nature of capsule, it has got a very low affinity for dyes. In this technique, crystal violet is applied which stains the bacterial cell. On the application of 20% copper sulphate solution, osmotic difference is created which causes diffusion of stain towards the outer surface of the cell. Copper sulphate acts as the decolorizing agent. It removes excess primary stain as well as the color from the capsule. At the same time, the copper sulphate also acts as a counter stain by being absorbed into the capsule and turning it a light blue color. Thus, the cells appear dark violet and the capsules pale blue. Coming back to the question, the capsule is made of polysaccharides or polypeptides which would get denatured on heating. Hence, we do not heat fix the smear in this staining preparation. Another method is that of negative staining. Capsules are also easily demonstrated by negative staining technique. Due to the non-ionic nature of capsule, as I said, it has very little affinity for the dye. Therefore, when you stain with a basic dye like crystal violet, the cell takes up the stain. On counter staining with nigrosin, an acidic dye, the background becomes dark. Thus, cells appear violet and capsules colorless against a dark background. Let us now discuss the functions of capsules. The functions of capsules are many. Capsules and slime layers are responsible for adhering cells to each other or to surfaces. This adherence is necessary 
for many bacteria to establish infection in appropriate hosts. A classic example is that of Streptococcus mutans which adheres to teeth and gums and is responsible for dental plaques. This bacterium breaks down sucrose into glucose and fructose. It uses an enzyme called glucosyl transferase to convert the glucose to a sticky polysaccharide called dextrin that forms its glycocalyx and allows it to adhere to the enamel and form a plaque. The capsular material may become reserves of carbohydrate for subsequent metabolism. The dextrin slime can be depolymerized to glucose for use as a carbon source resulting in production of lactic acid within the biofilm that decalcifies the enamel and leads to dental caries or bacterial infection of the tooth. The picture shows Streptococcus mutans and Streptococcus salivarius which store excess sugars as dextrin polymers giving the colonies a glistening appearance. Note the glistening appearance of both streptococcal colonies in the picture. Many urinary tract pathogens are known to form biofilms on catheters and other medical implants. A biofilm consists of layers of bacterial populations adhering to host cells and embedded in a common capsular mass. Formation of biofilms is a serious emerging medical problem. Persistent biofilms containing pathogenic bacteria can be problematic because bacteria in the biofilm are protected from antibiotics, detergents and disinfectants which cannot penetrate the slime. The picture shows a bacterial biofilm on a catheter. Another important function of capsules is their ability to resist phagocytosis. Glycoprotein molecules known as endocytic pattern recognition receptors are found on the surface of phagocytes. These receptors recognize and bind to pathogen associated molecular patterns, components of common molecules such as peptidoglycan, ticoic acids, lipopolysaccharides, mannans and glucans found in many organisms. Capsules can cover up these surface molecules preventing their attachment to the endocytic pattern recognition sites on the phagocyte. Thus, the bacterial cells are protected from being engulfed or destroyed by phagocytes. Bacillus anthracis resists phagocytosis because the lysosomal enzymes of the phagocytes cannot break down the polydeglutamate capsule of the bacteria. Similarly, Pseudomonas aeruginosa forms a biofilm which cannot be penetrated by the phagocytes. Other examples of bacteria that use their capsule to resist phagocytic engulfment include Haemophilus influenzae, Neisseria meningitis and Bortadella pertussis. Capsules have an important role in serotyping. The acidic polysaccharide antigens present in the capsule of the bacteria are called K antigens. K for capsule which is German for capsule. A total of 103 K antigens have been recognized. These antigens play an important role in serotyping. The Quelling reaction is a serological reaction where antibodies bind to the capsular antigens causing the capsules to enlarge resulting in an increase in the opacity and visibility of the capsule. This reaction was first described by Neofeld and hence also called Neofeld reaction. It forms the basis of serotyping. When a suspension of capsulated bacteria 
is mixed with equal quantity of specific antiserum and then examined microscopically at 1000x, the capsule becomes prominent and appears swollen. The picture shows positive reaction showing swollen capsules and negative reaction where capsules are not swollen. In the picture below, you can see pneumococcal cells with swollen capsules. Yet another function of the capsules is that most capsules are hydrophilic and may help the bacterium avoid desiccation or dehydration by preventing water loss. Let us now discuss the differences between capsule and the slime layer. The capsule consists of firmly associated polysaccharide molecules with cell wall whereas slime layer consists of loosely associated glycoprotein molecules. The capsule is composed mainly of polysaccharides but the slime layer is composed of polysaccharides, glycoproteins and glycolipids. As far as the thickness is concerned, the capsule is thick whereas the slime layer is thin. The capsule is a well organized layer but slime layer is an unorganized random layer. The capsule acts as a virulence factor that helps evade phagocytosis but slime layer aids in adherence and also protects the cell from desiccation. Now let us discuss the frequently asked questions in the university exams. I am sure after going through this lecture you would be able to answer most of the questions correctly. First, short answers which can be asked for 2.5 or 5 marks. Write a short note on membrane transport in bacteria. The next question is, write a short note on composition of the capsules. A question which has been asked almost every year is distinguish between the capsules and slime layer. We have just discussed the differences between capsules and slime layer in the last slide. Coming to the long answers which can be asked for 10 marks, the first question is discuss the structure of bacterial cell membrane in detail. Another frequently asked question is describe the functions of the bacterial cell membrane. Yet another question is explain the functions of the capsules in bacteria. 